And now I'm going to take you through a little bit of Western philosophy because this is what Western philosophy was all about. And all of the different brands of psychotherapy were there in ancient Athens already. Plato said, Socrates said, bad men live that they may eat and drink, whereas good men eat and drink that they may live. Because may, we may well want to do both those things. Socrates was the first philosopher, really, who said the unreflective life is not worth living. But that saying, you will find it everywhere, all over the place. You'll find it in Taoism, you'll find it in Islam, you'll find it in every world religion. The challenge to human beings is to learn to receive life, reflect on it, and make something of it. You know Plato's cave? You know how that works? That is absolutely the epitome of what existential therapy is about, as far as I'm concerned. You know, these guys here are sitting chained up to a wall with their back to the wall. They're watching these shadows on the wall of the cave on the other side. And you know what they're doing? They're sitting there their whole lives, arguing with each other, saying, this means this and that means that. And they're competing with each other and they're getting into all sorts of problems. What's actually happening is there's some other guys here that are marching up and down that wall with these images in their heads. And that is reflected on the wall because there's a fire here. Strange situation. Quite a lot like how we live a lot of the time, where we watch our screens and our televisions and we get very worked up about all sorts of things and we think we know better than the others and we get so in a huff about it all. Well, said Plato, what really needs to happen is that one day the philosopher needs to come into the cave and set these guys free. Take away their chains, allow them to get behind this wall, see what's happening with this fire, and then encourage them to climb out from that cave to the sunlight and discover that not only is there a different world here, but there's an entirely different world out there. That these poor guys have been completely alienated from. Well, that's existential therapy. When people come to me, they're like in chains. They're going round in their heads with all sorts of things that really ought not to be the problem. And when they start to think about the big issues, about the things that truly matter to them, that will matter to them by the time they die, hopefully at the age of 90, after a long productive life, then these problems are insignificant suddenly. They start to think about what their purpose is, what their direction is, what they want to do. Of course, there's another way to look at it, which is that they should explore the cave because the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. And that's true too. So you can play with meanings in all directions and as usual, Everything is true, but everything needs to be set in proportion and in perspective with everything else. So after Socrates came Plato, and after Plato came Aristotle, Plato taught Aristotle, and Aristotle thought that these ideas that Socrates and Plato had come up with were very helpful to enable people to live their lives in better ways. They were really psychotherapists, you know. They were talking with people, which is why um, Socrates, of course, had to die, because he was talking to the youth in Athens and he got them to have ideas about freedom and change and all that kind of thing. They were psychotherapists. 
And Aristotle thought, well, to be a proper psychotherapist, you have to have more knowledge. So he started this whole system of trying to describe human knowledge. But he also came up with this idea that what people should try to achieve is eudaimonia. Now, eudaimonia means to be on good terms with your demons, to be open to your spirits, to be in good conscience, if you like, to have that process of reflection and understanding going on inside of yourself at all times. And at the same time, he thought you had to benefit the community at large rather than just yourself. I won't go into it more. After that, we got the Epicureans who started to look at how to treat human suffering. Again, a psychotherapeutic system to try and make people happier. And what his solution was, was to eliminate all pain and disturbance, which is what he called ataraxia. Reduce your life so that you can just control what is still there and all the disturbing elements are gone and make the most of what you've got. After that, you got the skeptics. They did even weirder things. They said, if we can become skeptical and unknowing and uncaring about everything, then all our problems will be gone then nothing will upset us. We won't have emotions at all anymore because we'll just say, who cares? Or what's that? Or, hmm, not important. And so we get a little way of life without emotions where everything is hunky-dory. So they weren't getting rid of false beliefs. They got rid of all beliefs. Well, I know a fair few people like that these days too not a good way to live at all. The Stoics got a bit more clever about it. They said the goal has got to be that a person becomes their own teacher in the end and that we can improve a person's soul by making them exercise their soul every day. So they need to use logic and poetry and other arts to make themselves more open to the good things and so that the flourishing life can affirm good meanings like wisdom, courage, justice and temperance. But at the end of the day, it also meant detaching yourself from caring or worrying about things and they called that apathy. Many of my clients, when they start out, have a complaint about apathy. They have lost a sense of enjoyment or importance about their life. And what they prefer to do is stay in bed all day and not do anything, get away from everything they can. They're not happy at all, of course. So let me skip all the way about um, 15 centuries forwards now to the philosopher Spinoza, the reason I skip so fast, and I hope I'm not going to offend anybody, but what happened in between the Stoics and this time of Spinoza is that philosophy became entirely taken over by Christianity. And philosophy basically died as an open discipline. It was taken over by one way of looking at things. But with Spinoza, things change. And of course, Descartes is also a very important influence on that, much as he's maligned. Because Spinoza understood that our emotions are actually extremely important. That these early guys, these Athenians, got it all wrong. They tried each in their own way to stop our emotions taking us over. No, said Spinoza, what we need to do is understand our emotions, not reduce them, but actually make sense of them. And he understood something extremely important, which is that essentially we have two sorts of emotions. 
We have emotions that make us feel we're going up towards something that matters to us, or we have emotions that take us down, away from something that matters to us. Now, the funny thing is, when Kierkegaard talks about this, he says, all our emotions of aspiration, of going up, make us anxious. That's what anxiety is. Anxiety is those upswinging emotions that make us want something, that make us want to do something. Because what is anxiety? It's just a simple mechanistic thing. It's adrenaline. It's our bodies getting geared up for the thing we want to achieve, the thing we need to do. The problem arises when we want to do it on the one hand and on the other hand we suppress it. Then it spins out of control. It becomes like panic. So imagine you're sitting there thinking, oh my God, what rubbish she's talking. I wish I had the courage to say something about it. Shall I put my hand up? Shall I put my hand up? Shall I do it? Shall I not? Shall I do it? And you get this adrenaline, this lovely flow of energy, but you suppress it and you say to yourself, no, they're all going to think I'm stupid. Or, you know, it won't make any sense. Or she seems so in the flow, I don't dare cut her off. And so you suppress your energy and then you become slightly unpleasantly out of touch with yourself. But if you use the energy and you go for it and you go for that purpose that your passion directs you towards, you won't be anxious, you'll feel energized, you'll feel excited. I can guarantee you that it works that way. I used to be an extremely oversensitive and very nervous child and teenager and I put myself through lots of risky and difficult challenges and situations and once I learned that this is how it works, I could reinterpret those feelings and I could say, yeah, here it goes, I'm on a roll, here's my energy rising, great, I know what I want to do with it. And from that moment on, it was no longer a problem. So Spinoza took the view that the universe is lawful, which we pretty well think it is. And that therefore, if we understand how ontology works, we can basically work with that. And one of the things he found, and many others have found, is that everything has an opposite. This is how kids learn to make sense of their existence. They say something is low or high, big or small, far or near, good or bad. You know, when they read stories, it's about goodies and baddies, and they get really into this, this black and white thinking. It's either this or it's that. It's very important that we learn to do this because we learn to discriminate when we do that between one thing and another. But it is entirely wrong to think that that discrimination is in one thing and another because actually this is just a way for us to make meaning of things. What is really the case is that everything is incredibly complex and must be looked at in the round to really truly make sense of it. But at first we start with the flow of energy between the extremes. You know, there we are, the positive charge and the negative charge. That's what energy is, the flow between. That's what thunderstorms are like too. A positive charge on a sunny day with a negative charge at the bottom of the cloud and kaboom, you've got your lightning and your thunder. So, is there enough differential in your lives or are you running out of energy? How do you get the differential back into your life? Very often it is about having more diversity in your life, having more challenges in your life, having more difficulties in your life, having greater problems in your life. Ha! 
we turn it upside down because problems and difficulties are there to give you energy, to bring you to life, to make you think about solutions you can find, ways in which you can be creative around it. This is how life works.